The auxiliaries and the black and tans were demobbed and left quickly, seemingly as pleased to be leaving as the Irish were to see them go. The departure of the vast British military machine during the following months was, to most people, the outward sign that Ireland had achieved, after seven centuries, at least some semblance of independence. Only a small force of troops would remain to see the transfer of power. To Michael Collins, however, the real sign was the evacuation of Dublin Castle by the civilian administration, which he had partly crippled in the Custom House fire, and the remains of its intelligence network, blinded by him on Bloody Sunday. On the day of the takeover of Dublin Castle, Collins arrived some minutes late. And he marched up to the British commanding officer, and Dalton's feelings fell when the officer said to him, you're seven and a half minutes late, General Collins. Dalton thought Michael might pay a rather uncomplimentary reply, and Collins stepped up to him, put his hand on his shoulder and said, after seven and a half centuries, you're welcome to the seven and a half minutes. At the end of January, even as new uniforms were being hurriedly issued, Collins stood on the steps of City Hall alongside Dublin Castle as the first unit of the newly created Free State Army marched past to take over Beggar's Bush Barracks, former headquarters of the Black and Tans. But while this show of the new administration captured the headlines, there were rumblings and IRA activity in different parts of the country. In some areas, both the IRA and Free State Army almost jostled each other to take over from the British. To allow the people to vote on the treaty and to avoid a split in the Sinn Féin party, Collins and de Valera agreed to a political truce, a pact which enabled a constitution to be drawn up and submitted to the electorate along with the treaty in a general election. It was during these traumatic months that Michael Collins and Kitty Kiernan became officially engaged to be married. Irish and British reporters and photographers descended on Kitty's home in County Longford. Harry Boland, who had hoped to marry Kitty, wrote... Kitty, I want to congratulate you. Michael told me of your engagement, and I wish you long life and happiness. Simmering Republican discontent reached boiling point on the 14th of April, when a group of anti-treaty IRA men, or irregulars as they were called, seized the seat of legal administration in Dublin, the four courts, and other buildings in the city centre. Collins made no move to dislodge them. In June, the results of the general elections were announced. Those against the treaty secured only 36 of the 125 seats. Collins now had a clear mandate, and he was reminded of this in a letter from Lloyd George, who demanded that the IRA be removed from the four courts. Various suggestions were made at a staff meeting about what way to go about it best. It was suggested that they be starved from water, water supply cut off, and food supplies cut off. And uh, I'm afraid I personally objected to that. I was by way of being director of operations, amongst other problems, and I advocated uh, shelling it. And I mounted a gun at uh, the points where I thought they'd be most advantageous. Then I tried to instruct a team of four on how to load this gun. I had completely overlooked the fact that you've got to put the tail of the gun under something to stop the repercussion. The first thing that happened was that the gun jumped back and knocked three of us out practically. But the shell landed anyhow the four courts. The British had deceived me. They were told to give me high-velocity high shells. And instead of that, they'd given me shrapnel which was like hitting the place with features. But after two days of siege and the firing of almost 400 shells, the IRA surrendered. The Free State Army then concentrated on the other IRA strongholds in Dublin. IRA snipers had to be dislodged with machine guns and incendiary bombs from business premises, hotels, and even the tops of monuments. For five days the battles raged. Once again, the centre of the capital was laid waste. 
These weren't the first shots in the Civil War, but they did herald the outbreak of general warfare between pro- and anti-treaty sides throughout the country. Among the casualties of the Dublin fighting was Collins's one-time colleague, but latterly opponent, Cahal Brewer, who had refused to surrender. Eamon de Valera escaped. A war council was formed by the provisional government. Michael Collins was appointed commander-in-chief of the army with the rank of general. He resigned his cabinet position to devote himself to the war against former friends and comrades, the IRA. From this office in Portobello Barracks, ironically in later years renamed Cahal Brewer Barracks, he conducted his campaign. As he received daily casualty reports and the names in them of those who had once fought alongside him against a common enemy and for a common cause, his sense of grief mounted. He was completely kind of heavy-hearted at that time at the fact that brother was fighting against brother and so many families we knew like people who came to our house previously, they kind of, we all sh they all shunned one another then, which was really a terrible tragedy. The IRA had now concentrated its efforts on cities and towns outside Dublin. Again, the new army moved against them, forcing them out into the countryside. But in the south, the city and most of the county of Cork and its westerly neighbour, Kerry, stubbornly held out their access roads and rail links mined or blocked. In a masterly operation, Major General Dalton moved a huge force by sea from Dublin and sailed up the River Lee to capture Cork City by outflanking a defence set mainly against attack by land. It was a repetition of operations carried out in other areas in previous weeks. But the celebrations were short-lived. On the following day, President Griffith, exhausted and broken-hearted, suffered a massive stroke. Collins helped carry the coffin of his old friend from the pro-cathedral in Dublin. 300,000 people lined the funeral route to Glasnevin Cemetery. Dublin was in mourning for a man who had struggled all his life to wrench Ireland free from foreign rule, and yet lived only long enough to see his best efforts turn his fellow countrymen upon each other. Michael Collins would survive Arthur Griffith by only 10 days. On Saturday the 19th of August, Collins went to Greystones to have his confession heard. Did he perhaps have a premonition of death? At 6 o'clock the following morning, Collins left Portobello Barracks in a small convoy. Officially for an inspection tour of the South, he was, in fact, making a desperate and secretive effort to stop the Civil War. Collins had already made contact through mutual friends with neutral officers, those who hadn't taken either side in the current war. Through these officers, Collins would discuss peace with the leaders of the IRA side. Some of those leaders had already been captured and were being held in Port Leisha Prison, then called Maryborough Jail, in the South Midlands. Collins spent an hour talking to them, but obviously unsuccessful, left in a vexed mood for Limerick. Suffering from a heavy cold and a kidney infection, Collins had to stop frequently on the journey. The strain of his illness and his mental burden can be seen in this snapshot taken at the time. He was edgy too. Watching his men remove a bridge obstruction near Kelmallock, he didn't notice the approach of the amateur photographer who took this picture. The click of the shutter made Collins snatch for his revolver. After inspecting the Free State garrison at Newcastle West, he travelled southeastwards to Mallow in County Cork for more talks, and then that evening to the Imperial Hotel in Cork City, where Emmett Dalton had set up his headquarters. I was concerned to see him there, because I knew how, uh, how boyish he was. I mean, how I knew the warmth and the extent of his heart. And he had so many connections and associations with Cork, and West Cork particularly. He had a devout love for his people. They didn't understand him. And he felt that uh, I told him he was taking an unnecessary risk. And so they, he said, surely he said, they won't shoot me in my own county. Joe Postley. You know, you know the secret. On the following day, Collins travelled some 30 miles with Dalton to McCroom, where he had secret talks with an influential neutral IRA officer. 
That afternoon, he made the last entry in his personal diary. The people here want no compromise with the irregulars. It would be a big thing to get civic guards both here and in Limerick. Civil administration urgent everywhere in the south. The people are splendid. Everywhere Collins went, he was surrounded by well-wishers. But like Emmett Dalton, Kitty Kiernan at home in Longford was concerned about his safety. In his final letter to Kitty, he wrote, Kitty, you won't be cross with me for the way I go around. I can't help it. And if I were to do anything else, it wouldn't be me. And I really couldn't stand it. And somehow I feel the way I go on is better. And please, please don't worry. One of those who dined with Collins in Cork City was his nephew, Sean, then a quartermaster sergeant in the Free State Army. There were two soldiers supposed to be on sentry duty in the foyer of the Imperial Hotel. And they were leaning up against one another, half asleep or something like that. But he came and banged their heads together and walked straight in, which I rather enjoyed. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was his gesture of saying he knew what went on. And he just bumped them together out the nonsense and got on with the business. So he went into a small dining room in the Imperial Hotel where he met my mother and we had tea together at his table in the hotel. Now, he told us at that stage what he was going to do because he was really going to go home to Sam's Cross to see the people there. He was always interested in that. And I rather stupidly and foolishly said, said could I go with him? And you can imagine what he said to me. <laughs> At least he, I got, a, I got a, a firm no. Mind my own business and do what I had been employed on. What was his mood like at that meeting? Uh, very jovial, uh, a bit tired, a bad cold. Of course, it began with it being with the ladies. My mother was more concerned about the state of his health than he was and what he was going to do in Sam's Cross. <coughs> but he had a very severe cold bordering on pleurisy, but she knew that before he ever started. They, for, a, for a very humane reason, she didn't want him, him to travel to Cork at all at the stage, because he wasn't well enough, really. He, but however, he went on and, and did it. So that I would describe him at that time as uh, in reasonably good form. He was a very serious fellow, you know. He didn't waste time talking about himself. And he didn't have much time for... Uh, discussion other than discussion on the family. At 6.15 on the morning of Tuesday the 22nd of August, Collins with Emmett Dalton set off in a military convoy from the Imperial Hotel in Cork City. The convoy consisted of a motorcycle scout, Lieutenant John Joseph Smith, nicknamed Jersey Smith, from Enniscorthy in County Wexford, a British Army veteran, later the IRA, and now the Free State Army. Behind him, a tender carrying eight riflemen, two Lewis machine gunners, and two officers, including the man in charge of the convoy, Commandant Sean O'Connell, known as Paddy O'Connell from Dura, Ennis County, Clare. O'Connell was one of Collins's original 12 apostles. Collins and Dalton sat in the back of an open-topped yellow touring car, a Leyland Thomas, driven alternately by Privates Mick Corrie from Cheshire in England, and Quinn, an Irishman, ex-IRA. Bringing up the rear of the convoy was Schlieven Amon, a Rolls-Royce Whippet armoured car. This carried five, including machine gunner John McPeak, who manned the Vickers .303 gun in its revolving turret. McPeak, a native of Glasgow, was another British Army veteran who had joined the IRA and subsequently enlisted in the new Irish Army. It was certainly not an adequate escort for a commander-in-chief in territory teeming with guerrilla fighters. Again on this day, Collins travelled west to McCroom to speak to a neutral officer, Flory Donoghue, then to Bandon via the tiny village of Bailnabla. Here at Bailnabla, they asked directions for Bandon. Unknown to Collins, senior brigade and divisional IRA officers from various parts of the county had been gathering in this farmhouse overlooking the village and in the local public house for a war council on this very day.